Hey, welcome to another exciting edition of the Give Me Liberty podcast, where we defend life, liberty, and truth to ensure the foundations of freedom exist for the next generation. We're here at Liberty University. Why are we here? Well, we're having a great conversation with Katie Faust, who's the author of a, a book that came out just last year, very important. It's called Them Before Us, Why We Need a Global Children's Rights Movement. Look, when it comes to education, there are no accidents. Ultimately, we have to understand that we have a responsibility before God as parents and even as students, as children, right? All of us have a responsibility. This is an important conversation. When you look about what is happening around the nation uh, when it comes to drag queen story hours or even what happened in Dallas, Texas more recently at a bar, uh, parents who are indoctrinating, not discipling their children, but indoctrinating them in a LGBTQ plus activism. At the end of the day, we have a stewardship for these kids. So join me in this conversation, really important, coming up next on the Give Me Liberty podcast, starting now. Hey, welcome back to the Give Me Liberty podcast. I'm joined by a very special guest who is the co-author of the book, Them Before Us, Why We Need a Global Children's Rights Movement. Uh, Katie Faust, welcome. It's good to see Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, love this podcast. Love this. I'm so enthusiastic about a genuinely Christian university that is also speaking into the culture. So kudos to you. Hey, thank you very much. And so honored to have you. And this has been several, several weeks in the making. Um, been looking forward to having you on. My wife is a huge fan of yours. Um, we, you know, she homeschools. We've got three kids. We've been homeschooling since we were in the state of Kentucky. I worked for the former governor there. Uh, so our kids are 11, 10, and four. Um, homeschooling is, is is really about um, following through with a vision that God has given us for, you know, well, really from creation on, but even God's vision for a Christian family and how we are supposed to be parents uh, in raising children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. And so we were talking a little bit off camera. I wanted, I was like, oh my gosh, we got to get this interview started because you, you're on fire already. Um, go back to something that you were just saying uh, off camera uh, whose responsibility? You see everything right now in culture, Katie. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about the shocking headlines over the weekend. Uh, Dallas, Texas, this drag queen uh, dance-a-thon or whatever was going on down there in Dallas. Dallas is my home city uh, where I was raised. Went, I went to a Christian school down there. Um, but parents, parents are taking their children or maybe their parental guardians, I don't know, to this bar to see this drag queen. It's not a story hour. It's like a strip dance. No. I don't know what's no, going it's on. A, right. It's a, it's not going to lick itself event or whatever they had in yes. the background there. Yeah. It's total insanity. Um, and so, you know, I, we are here to talk about book number one, but I am in the process of writing book number two with my incredible co-author because she and I both live in the belly of the beast in Seattle in the bluest of blue cities. And our kids, for the most part, go to the horrible woke public schools, right? So we're writing a book called Raising Conservative Kids in a Woke City, which is just the way that we have successfully, so far, right? So far, passed our conservative values, which are Christian values, <laughs> down to our kids. And we've got elementary schoolers all the way up through college students. And um, this is your job, parents. Whether your kids are homeschooled, private schooled, public schooled, whatever it is, you are the primary educator. You are the one, number one, that they're most likely to absorb these concepts from, that um, you know, you've got to maximize your influence with your kids, especially up until age 10. Right? Why is it that all of these public schools are going after elementary school kids? Because it is that age where developmentally, they accept unquestioningly whatever it is that adults they like tell them. Well, guess what? You are the adult they like the most. And so you need to maximize your influence with your kids, especially in the elementary school years, to pour into them all the goodness, truth, and beauty of the natural world, of God's world, of the world of reality, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that is the perfect setup to then move into the middle school and high school years where they are going to have to confront some of these very distorted and damaging ideologies and get to the place where they can not only spot the lie, 
but then fight back. And so the book is basically about how, look, if two moms in a blue city with kids going to public schools can do it, you can do it. Even if you're in a red state, even if you're, you know, even if the, the deck is seemingly less stacked against you, these are principles that everybody can employ. And it begins with recognizing that you parents are the program. There's no camp. There's no like course that you can just say, hey, kids, do this and you're going to be fine. You parents are the program. And the bad news is nobody can do it except you. But the good news is you really are all that your kids need. Yeah, I like how you said that. And I want to encourage anybody who might be listening to um, there's there might be this thing where if you're a parent, uh, mom and dad, your family together and you're making hard economic decisions, financial decisions, and you're saying, look, there's no way that we can make it. Uh, both of us, you know, uh, have to work. We have to provide for our family. Unders I understand those constraints. I hate this kind of us versus them kind of mentality where some people immediately are turned off when they hear uh, maybe about homeschooling, right? Or, or maybe about private school. What you're trying to do is paint a picture and give a, a vision for families to be active in raising their kids and also, they're also, in many of them, mixed situations where they might be going to a public school, you're still heavily involved in the education of your child. So that that's something I want to, anybody to hear. That some people, if they think, well, this is a homeschooling thing, you know, I'm going to turn off listening because that's not really for me. We've already decided that's not really for us as a family. So... What do we do? I, I guess the question, the first question for for you is, you know, in this book, Them F Before Us, what's the real purpose of marriage, family, and parenthood uh, when it comes to education? Oh, my goodness. So now we are like blending my two passions, right? You have absolutely caught me up in like the very best question you could ever ask me because I'm really passionate about two things. Number one is my kids. Right? Making sure that my kids are not consumed by the woke machine, making sure that they are not sucked in to these horrible, damaging, pervasive lies that are everywhere in their friend group, in their classrooms, on social media. Right. And so how do we build into our kids, whether or not you're homeschooling, which God bless the families that can and do. Some right. people can't, some people won't. Right. But you have got to protect your kids. Right. This is priority number one for every parent that cares about their child's heart, body, and mind, and soul. You have to do this, right? So that's one of my passions, is making sure that my kids are influencing culture, not influenced by culture. My other passion is defending the children of the world. And the way that we need to do that is by protecting children's fundamental rights. Um, and so the book that you held up is called um, Them Before Us, Why We Need a Global Children's Rights Movement. And you conservatives that are listening, um, some of you are kind of triggered by that, like, mm, I don't know, because the left has absolutely adulterated the term children's rights. To co and they've co-opted it to mean horrifying things like uh, children have the right to consent to sexual pleasure, you know, and children have a right to conceal their transgender identity from their parents at school in the name of privacy and all kinds of insane things like that. But actually, conservatives are the king and queen of understanding how to properly defend children's rights because we have been doing it successfully for the last 50 years when it comes to a child's primary right to life. Why do you think we're in this place where we're about to overturn Roe versus Wade? Because we have made the compelling and effective case that regardless of how adults suffer or struggle, no child's right to life should be sacrificed on the altar of adult desires. Mm -hmm. What we've done in Them Before Us, why we need a global children's rights movement, is we have taken that same perspective, but we've looked at it in terms of children's rights on this side of the womb. And that is that children have a fundamental natural right to be known and loved by their mother and father. And when you take that lens of children's rights in the family, it actually offers you an effective template on how to fight for children's rights when it comes to all issues of marriage and family. So the definition of marriage, whether or not no fault divorce should be something that we support, same sex parenting, reproductive technologies, transgender parents, cohabitation, polygamy, surrogacy, sperm and egg donation, even questions of adoption. When we center the conversation around the rights of a child to be known and loved by their mother and father, we get 
the best policy decisions and the best personal decisions every time. Hmm. That's good. That's very good. I, I think about, you know, where we are, you know, as a culture in the United States, um, you think about the boomer generation has often been known as or called the me generation. And the Gen Xers are largely cynical. Um, I don't know what the millennials really are. I'm considered a millennial by the by my time stamp. Um, but what's interesting is that children, when we think about putting children first, you're not necessarily talking about parents uh, dragging their kids to all kinds of soccer games, skipping out in church on Sunday. I think about those types of things, right? For a Christian audience where they put children first, but no, they've made an I idol out of basically programming their child. That's not what you're talking about as far as a child-centric view. Um, there is a difference, right? But your understanding yeah. is that children are a steward, uh, stewardship, that God has given you a stewardship over your children to love and to sacrifice for, um, and that, that this is a God-given responsibility. You have a duty before God to raise them up a certain way. That part is being sacrificed on the altar of vacation and me and whatever priorities I have, you know, you know, as an adult that I don't really want my, my children getting in the way of those priorities, basically. Yeah, exactly. So there, you can fall into two different errors, right? Which are both incredibly damaging to children. The first one is that your children are your gods. Right. And everything that you need to do centers around your kids. Um, you know, I, I would say that that's sort of where this idea of like self-direction begins. Right. Our, our children are going to self-identify. We're never going to confront them. We're going to give them everything. We're, we're going to affirm everything that they think and say and do. Right. Our children are gods. We're not going to do anything to um, conflict with what their inner self says. Obviously false. Right. But children are also not objects to be sacrificed on the altar of your sexual God. And that is really where we see things headed right now in the debate around marriage and family and parenthood, is that adult desire, adult sexual identity, adult romantic aims and goals are so shaping, not just our cultural landscape, but our legal landscape, that children are now considered um, not even their own persons in a lot of ways. They are objects to be sacrificed on the altar of adult desire. Right? Yeah. And sometimes now we look at children as things that, adults are entitled to, right? They have a right to parenthood. They have a right to a child, even if they're in a single or non-procreative relationship. And so honestly, that is where we are post Obergefell, post the Supreme Court legislating from the bench that gay marriage should be the law of the land. What did that really do when it came to our legal landscape? Really what they said is, same-sex couples need to be completely equal to heterosexual couples in all matters of marriage and family. Well, there's a problem with that because when it comes to kids, biology is quite a bigot. Biology insists that a man and a woman be present at the birth of the child, at the conception, at the birth, and maximizes their childhood development if they are there for the raising of the child. But now biology is deemed discriminatory too exclusive. So the law now has to accomplish what biology prohibits. And that is making two adults the same sex, parents to a child. And so what we are seeing is this incredible legal contortions taking place so that single adults or two moms or two dads mm -hmm. um, can become the parents of a child. And so the law has to do what biology prohibits here. So what we are seeing now is is all of these conversations, many of these conversations bending around adult desire to acquire children. And when you pair that with the reproductive technologies, right, this massive market of children that is being created in sperm donation, donation, egg donation, complete embryo donation, surrogacy, all of this means that children are now items to be acquired by whatever adults have the money and means to facilitate the assembling of sperm, egg, and womb. So children are absolutely in the context of the family structure debate. Children are no longer considered subjects of rights. They are objects of rights. And that is a major issue for anybody concerned about the well-being of kids. Yeah, I think about where we are too. You know, I, I forget 
you know, in America, how many billions of dollars that we spend on pet products in this country, dog food, right? Taking care, you know, vet bills and all this, that, that, uh, Pets have been long time a commodity in this country. You have these designer pets, right, that are to fulfill need for companionship. And, and people will call themselves dog parents, right? A dog dad or a mom dad or a cat dad. And you look at that, and you're like, that is so ridiculous. That's so silly. But guess what? Here comes children now. And through surrogacy in different forms, by the way, I believe in adoption. But what we're, what we're talking about with surrogacy is far more involved and removes the role of mom and dad from that. Uh, there was a more famously, I think within the past couple of months, a, con a so-called conservative commentator uh, who, who actually is in a homosexual marriage who just committed to surrogacy adoption. Um, this is actually an inhumane practice, uh, and it is not obviously non-biblical and inhumane. Those go hand in hand. Um, but recognizing, though, that when you treat pets like children, children are often treated also like pets. And so it is all about you know, I, I get to do with them whatever I wish. If you go back to the biblical command, though, we have a responsibility before God in how we raise our children. They are not our own property. They belong to the Lord. I think of the story of Samuel in the Old Testament. Hannah was given a, a, a boy that he ultimately she committed to God. And that's honestly um, not just a one single story that we hold over here, but we say, you know what? That's actually a model for how Christian parents should raise their children, knowing ultimately that you will have to give them to the Lord um, and, and give them to God. Well, you know, you're talking to a woman who lives in a city where there's more pets than children yeah. per capita. Yeah. I mean, this is a place where people talk about their fur babies much more than they talk about their real babies. Um, because, and, and yeah, that does bleed over into the way that we think about and conceptualize children, right? That we're entitled to them or that they exist to validate us. Um, and, you know, or they, they exist to meet our need rather than us existing for them. And so all of that has seeped into, unfortunately, all of the ways that we think about children rather than understanding that they are a gift, right? We, they are a gift to us. We're not entitled to them. We don't have a right to our children. Well, we have a right to the children that we give birth to, but you don't have a right to somebody else's child. And then, you know, the, which is in this world of me-centric adult entitled like culture, unfortunately, that is a lot of the ways that we think about kids, right? They exist for me. And that's exactly backwards. We exist for them if God gives us the gift of having children. Um, and yes, we have to get this straight. You know, I am uh, stunned by the slide, even among conservatives, into this world of adult-centric narratives when it comes to marriage and family. Like, we just hit, once again, one of the highest levels of approval of same-sex marriage among conservatives, among Republicans, right? Well, guess what, Republicans? You really don't, you can't have anything that you want. There will be no small government. There will be no low taxes. There will be no reduced money spent on school programs and anti-poverty programs and welfare unless you have big marriage. And marriage, same-sex marriage, is not the same thing as traditional marriage, right? Traditional marriage is the only relationship that unites the two people to whom children have a natural right, their mother and father. Same-sex marriage, when there's a child in that household, will always exclude one adult to whom children have a natural right. These things, when it comes to kids, do exactly the opposite. So Christians and conservatives need to get it very, very straight that we can never compromise, we can never hand over, we can never capitulate on the topic of the traditional family. And unfortunately, all of these conservative organizations that are platforming Dave Rubin, who I love, like, yeah. I love Dave Rubin. Right. Right. I've been following him forever. Thank God that he speaks so clearly on topics like free speech. But I'm sorry, you cannot have a man who is in one breath making videos for PragerU, decrying Black Lives Matter for their destruction of the nuclear family and destroying the nuclear family of two children by making them intentionally motherless, by separating them from their genetic mother, intentionally commodifying and renting the womb of their birth mother to take them home to a permanently motherless family, talking about the importance of the nuclear family. Yeah. 
I'm sorry, but we have got to get this straight. And all of this honestly comes together when we take a child-centric approach to marriage and family. If we think that marriage and family is just about the validation of adults and their bonds and with whom they share love and commitment, then sure, Dave Rubin and his husband Dave can be a marriage. But if you are looking at this from the perspective of the child, those two men are not married and should never be able to intentionally create a motherless child. So if any of you guys are listening to this, slack jawed, can't believe it, everything that you need to know about this is in our book. We talk about the harms of sperm and egg donation in chapter seven, where we give you probably 30 stories of kids who are created through these processes who desperately long to be known by their genetic parents and go on decades long searches to try to find them. We have an entire chapter on surrogacy and how surrogacy is never child friendly, never. Even if it's a sweet heterosexual couple that is using her sister to create their dream baby. We have a whole section on adoption, contrasting why adoption supports children's rights, but third party reproduction violates children's rights. I know this is a new topic for some of you, but honestly, you all have to become an expert on this because the lives of children and the health of our society depends on it. Yeah, I totally agree, Katie. I think about um, the difference between conservatives who are all about conserving, uh, conserving and all about principles, right, that are timeless, right, time-tested, that transcend. You think about the good, the beautiful, the true, all of those things are, are about conserving society and, and ultimately, um, in, in terms of um, in terms of natural revelation, right? Um, do they do they reflect back what God has um, deemed, you know, uh, to be good in terms of founding of the institutions, the institution of marriage? All of these things are super super important, and you have within. Republican politics or Democrat politics, this gerrymandering where they're trying to create new constituencies and new affinity groups by sort of placating. So we're going to have our we're going to have our um, different identity groups, right, uh, within Republicanism, for for example. And so these people identify as a part of the LGBT community, but they're the conservative version of that, right? So they're they're opposed to all these other things. They don't want to be about indoctrination, and they want to be about free speech. But but at the end of the day, you know, they they're a same sex couple, and because of Obergfell, right, uh, the state has deemed this to be a marriage, even though it's not recognized by God's court and certainly not recognized by the church. I think we're, we, we have our work cut out for us. Um, one of the things that I'm hopeful in is I believe the gospel of Jesus Christ does not return void. I believe that, it, that, that ultimately the Lord wins. I think that if parents who stand up for biblical truth uh, say no uh, to Caesar and yes to their children uh, and will be committed to raising them with biblical principles and these foundations, I think the future is very bright for any kind of free movement in education, whether it happens locally or, as you say, globally. I think I'm, I'm very hopeful with that picture. What, what say you? Well, absolutely. And, and just to go back to the beginning of your um, comment, like we, I love Barry Weiss. I love Dave Rubin. I think that gay conservative is the best Twitter, right? These men are wickedly smart and they absolutely belong with us, right? On the conservative side of things, because what is conservatism? It is really these days, conservatism is not just let's return to the gold standard. Conservatism is anybody that recognizes biological, historical, and economic reality. That right. is what a concern makes you today, right? right? right. So I love these new voices, but it takes more than just being anti-left right. to be a conservative. You have to know what you are conserving, and you had better be conserving the realities of the natural family. And so in that sense, Barry Weiss, Dave Rubin, they have a lot to say when it comes to aspects of freedom and the goodness of America, but they're not true conservatives, right? We have to get back to the point where we know what it is that we are conserving. And if you are not conserving the natural family, good luck with anything else, with any yeah. other priorities that you are trying to pursue. And when it comes to like, what is our hope for the future? Well, you know, I completely, I'm a, I'm a Baptist pastor's wife, right? Like I carry my Bible around with me everywhere. The Bible scripture is my ultimate authority, but 
I will tell you that the authority of general revelation, the authority of the natural world is enough when it comes to understanding why the ways of the left and their disconnection from the reality ultimately is going to fail. You know, as my friend Doug Mainwaring says, who is a gay man, supporter of traditional marriage says, you're never gonna be on the wrong side of history when you're on the right side of natural law, right? And natural law obviously points to the fact that children come from a man and woman, that they have a right to that man and woman, and that being raised by that married man and woman stacks the deck in favor of their thriving. Um, and every major is issue that we see in the world today, from child poverty to teen incarceration, teen suicide, teen homelessness, you know, teen pregnancy, every single social ill that you are trying to solve with hundreds and billions of dollars, all of those demographics have something in common, and that is that they're disproportionately fatherless. Mm -hmm. There is no social justice unless we can secure justice for the individual child when it comes to their right to their mother and father. These things will not remain hidden. At some point, natural law, the natural truths that have been written into God's world are going to rise back to the surface. And so we, conservatives and Christians, need never be ashamed. In fact, we need to double down and we need to speak up on the goodness of God's design for sex and marriage and the family because it really has the potential, outside of a revival, probably the greatest potential to save our nation. So we need to get serious. We need to become experts about this. That's one of the main reasons we wrote the book, was to tell you, you never need to apologize. To understand God's design, his truth is on our side. And we compile hundreds of studies and hundreds of stories of kids who have lived through these modern families so that you can speak with courage and confidence in their defense. Mm. Very, very well said. Katie, I want to encourage everybody uh, to get this book, if you haven't already, Them Before Us, Why We Need a Global Children's Rights Movement. And we're looking forward to your next uh, book coming out very, very soon. Thank you for joining the Give Me Liberty podcast for all you're doing, uh, especially for your husband and for your family, for your children. Uh, really appreciate you coming on today. Thanks for having me. Hey, thank you for joining the Give Me Liberty podcast. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Very, very important. Like and share, comment, subscribe, and also share with a friend. Only a true friend shares the gift of the Give Me Liberty podcast. Until next time, God bless you.